Hey, uh, talky internet thingy. Yeah, could you uh, find me a voiceover podcast that has more than one person on it? It's not boring and, you know, it's, it's, you know. There's a lot of VO podcasts out there sharing a lot of insight and knowledge. But on another VO podcast, you get to hear from three guys who are accountability partners and who all have a different story of how their VO careers came together. Do they have all the answers? Probably not. But between the three of them, they've made all the mistakes you don't want to make. And hey, they're really nice guys. Well, pretty much. Here's Jake, Alden, and Troy with another VO Podcast. Welcome back to another VO Podcast. We are continuing this run of guests and interviews. So happy today to have an industry leader with us, someone that has um, done so much for the industry is his kindness, his openness, uh, all the things he does. We want to welcome J. Michael Collins. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. And, and I know I said right before we went on, we're going to try not to be mundane, but sometimes it's hard not to hit, <laughs> so, <laughs> hit some of those same hard, questions. Hard for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I found uh, on the other podcast, I did like 130 episodes. And by the time you get to about 25, you're out of subjects. Mm. And if you're not interviewing people, you know, you better be coming up with some weird things or current events going on or whatever. So it's, yeah, Uh, it's hard. We we get weird. It's cool. Right. It's hard. It's hard. (laughs) So uh, JMC traveling all the time, doing workshops, uh, sharing experiences, conferences, and working in voiceover. One of the things I wanted to bring up first out of the shoot, conferences seem to be over the last couple of years, really growing more people wanting to go more people realizing the value of attending. Mm-hmm. And in your opinion, what's one of the number one expectations you should have when you come to a conference? Well, I think that, you know, conferences serve a couple of different purposes. And I love that there's so many of them out there that have different shapes and sizes and flavors and themes these days. And I think that the conference organizers, uh, including ourselves, are getting better and better at differentiating lineups so that you don't have the same experience every time you go to a different conference. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of expectations, I think it's twofold. I think, you know, first is obviously the content is there for a reason. Um, And if the curator of the conference has done a good job, then the content uh, ought to have the value that is, uh, you know, synonymous with with the price of the ticket, and uh, and you should be getting what you pay for there, just in terms of learning and growing. Um, you know, different conferences are targeted towards different segments of the industry. You've got some that are really targeted towards working pros. You've got some that are really targeted at the business of the business, like Karin's vocation conferences. Um, you've got some like VO Atlanta that are a catch all that we you know we have content for everybody from brand new aspiring VOs to people who are six-figure earners and beyond. Um, so they're all a little bit different, but uh, the content's number one. Number two, and I, I you know, I don't think this gets talked about enough, um, uh, and, and there is one of the, you know, dirty little secret things that I like to tell people with conferences is that, uh, you know, when you go and you pass out your business card and you, you get in front of all those casting directors and agents and managers and everybody else, look, people know I hire talent sometimes, so I get 500 business cards at a conference too. Guess what? They stay in the room when I leave. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> for the for the CDs and the agents and the managers, it's the same. They're not taking those home and putting them in a Rolodex. Now, if you stand out in one of their sessions, you know, you do have those stories of a handful of people getting signed off at the back of each conference, right? But for the most part, the the contacts that you make, the, the relationships that you make at conferences that are going to be really valuable are your fellow talent. And it's the ones that you break bread with. It's the ones that you go do karaoke with. It's the ones that you just spend time getting to know because Mm -hmm. even though I agree with the, the broad philosophy of don't market to your fellow talent in general, doesn't mean that your wide circle of friends will not impact your bottom line. We hire each other all the time. Okay. And the more friends you have in this business, the more work you're going to book. And so the more people you get to know in real life, I always tell, you know, I hire coaching students and demo students, but I usually tell them, Hey, if I just know you over zoom, 
I'm probably not going to hire you. It's usually right. somebody I've broken bread with, somebody I've had a laugh with, had a beer with, whatever, that, you know, I eventually, I mean, got, you know, look at like, some of my best friends, not just in VO, but in life now. I'm going to another hockey game with Patrick Kirchner tonight. Patrick was one of my students six or seven years ago. Brad Highland was one of my students, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and now they're my boys. We go to games, we hang out, and guess what? I throw them jobs, right? Yeah, um, right. And they throw me jobs from time to time. So, uh, you know, make friends in this business because that that to me that's the big value the secret value in the conference mm. is that you find your tribe and the circle that you wind up kind of thriving together with yeah and somehow we answered the next question and this is verbatim do you feel association is a part of this industry many people don't work at <laughs> right. and, and and we do there are a lot of people that don't work at that association with other people and you really should i know my first year down i, I was a fly on the wall i needed to learn the conference understand the conference understand the people uh, I learned really quickly how approachable everyone was and began mm -hmm. to make conversation with people. But year two, I made a really big effort to to get up and shake hands right. with people, talk to people, have a drink with people. And it made a big difference. I mean, that mm -hmm. made this past year totally different for me in right. my career. Well, I mean, it's I think people now, you know, the, Troy Holden, do you say your name? We know who you are. You're visible. You're you're somebody who's out there. We met you. We know you. Right. And you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're one of us now. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> You have been assimilated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's um, uh, let's talk about just subtle differences. Jake, you were a volunteer at yeah. One Voice. Yeah. Um, I've been to VO Atlanta twice, uh, ready to go for the third time. Um, let's talk a little bit about the differences. Jake, jump in and tell us, you know, your experience at One Voice and what it meant to you. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks again, uh, uh, Jay, for putting that out there, that whole volunteer uh, possibility. Absolutely. And, I, and thanks for Troy for pointing it out. He said, hey, there's this going on, because I, I live less than an hour outside of Dallas, so I was just able to make that quick trek over there in the morning. Um, but yeah, just getting to help out was great, because one, I was wearing a giant red shirt that said, ask me questions, so everybody <laughs> from fellow voice talent to agents <laughs> and casting directors would ask me questions. And then I could, you know, off, obviously offer services and whatnot as far as I can tell you where the room is. I can walk you there. I can get you right. something to drink if you need a kind of thing. And that alone already allowed me to just kind of show my prior VO experience, which was customer service. And I just I just feed into that. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm there ready to be helpful. But at the same time, I was able to pass out some cards. I was able to make connections. And, and, and some of those actually, you know, grew into something after the fact. So that right there alone was was worth it just to volunteer. And I like helping people out in general. You know what I mean? I want right. to pass on what I know or be available to those people if they need it. Uh, and so that that's that's what I got out of it was just being able to be helpful, but also being able to stand out as someone that people could come to for that help, you know, and know they Very could trust cool. me to do that. Very so. cool. Yeah, and the sports analogy I take away from it is VO Atlanta is like the Super Bowl, and One Voice is like one of the final playoff games. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's, they've grown out of where VO Atlanta is, but you know, by a country mile, the largest one. We had a thousand attendees last year, and wow. we're on track now because we we learned we learned last year we can't do more than that at that venue. So uh, we learned we learned that um, we had to shut off sales on the Friday last year. Our tracking right now has us selling out in early to mid February. So. Wow. Um, you know, it's obviously a conference of substantial size. And then uh, One Voice has become the second biggest one uh, over time. And uh, now I think we did a little over 400 uh, this year. Um, and so uh, that one continues to grow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're all they, they've all got their own vibes. They're all a little bit different, but they're all there's not a bad conference out there. They're all they're all worthwhile in their own way. Sure. So we have both of those coming up um, next year, uh, early March, and then uh, August. Do you, do you have the set dates yet for both? Yeah. Well, yeah. I know so, you do for so Atlanta. So Atlanta is the 7th through 10th of March. Um, v, uh, One Voice is the 8th through 12th of August. Let me just double check that so you don't catch me lying here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. That Let's see. Right. No, no fake news here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. August 2024. Uh, the. Hold on. 
Yeah, the eighth is the Thursday. Um, so I, again, the core content, like normal, will be the the ninth and the tenth, uh, but the eighth through the twelfth. And there's a reason that I can't reveal yet that we're talking about the Monday being part of it also, but that may not impact everybody. But for the moment, that's eighth through twelfth of August. Nice. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. That's exciting. Awesome. Awesome. Let's flip over to demos for a second. We're always mm-hmm. hearing about current trends, changes in demos, and everything. Where are we? today i know jake and i have both done demos with you mm-hmm. and um uh, really appreciate you know what that has done uh the the insight it has given me and some of the follow-up that you and i have done it's just been uh you know it's been invaluable but where where are we now with trends as far as time and what's going right. on well it helps when i got guys like you who don't suck uh so that, that's <laughs> nice but, uh in terms of trends the it, the trends change based on the genre Okay, so um, demos, the genre determines the content, the length, what's appropriate, what isn't. Um, I think one of the trends we've seen recently that I that I, I personally like as a demo producer and, and an artist uh, in this is that um, there was for a while this really vocal minority of people going, your demo has to be exactly one minute. Um, and they were a very vocal minority, but they were always a minority. And I think that, you know, I've heard casting girls, even Marilyn Wisner at, at, at uh, one of the recent panels that she did was like, you know, I think commercial demo might eventually be four 30 second spots, be two minutes, because we've got buyers who want to hear you sustain the read. One of the really interesting things that came out of COVID was that there was more hiring being done off of demos. And one of the mm-hmm. pieces of feedback that casting directors were getting was we hired this person based on their demo samples, which sounded great, but they were all seven seconds long and they can't sustain a 30. Wow. Right. Mm, um, mm. So now I just I don't think we're going to get to four 30 second spots. I don't think it's going to be two minutes, but I do see now the sweet spot with commercial is, you know, 115 to 130 or so. And, right. you know, and you can yeah. sneakily get away with a little bit longer if you want, um, you know, promo, same kind of neighborhood, 115, 130 is a decent ballpark um, trailer and most broadcast genres. TV narration documentary, you can sneak up towards two minutes. If you talk to Tom Pinto, it'll tell you two minutes is, you know, sort of the limit with that political same kind of thing, 90 seconds to two minutes, you're all right. Non-broadcast narration, again, 90, you know, 130 is often a, a, a sweet spot for a lot of different genres. I don't think there are any genres where you ever want to go over the two-minute mark. Um, that just starts to get a little bit too much, uh, mm-hmm. and being maybe a little bit shy of that in general is good. But, you know, I, I think with uh, also the fact that especially on online platforms, um, individual samples are becoming more prominent. And I think there's become a little bit of a bifurcation where um, in the brick and mortar world of voiceover, the agents, the managers, casting directors, production companies, ad agencies, they still want the classic demo um, because mm-hmm. they have their specific uses for that. It's about getting representation. It's about the client listening to the whole thing. Um, they may be casting off of their site. And they don't have the time to necessarily build out a site where they're breaking out millions of little samples. But on the pay to play sites and on other online casting forums, um, the individual samples are becoming more important now. Right. So you still want to have your master demo, but you then want to have your demo producer break that down into the individual cuts. And on top of that, if you can do more individual cuts, I've been uh, remiss in that I've been working on a project now for about, it, I, it's something I should have done much faster. But uh, as a demo producer, I am on, I still maintain a voice one, two, three account. Um, and uh, I'm trying to create a thousand individual samples to put on my voice one, two, three account to match every possible read style that I can do off of all of the keywords that they have. So that basically I come up page one, number one on every search. Um, wow, and it's just brilliant. a question of getting the time to do that. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, so it's a little bit of a change between the, the two different areas in terms of what's important. Cool thing is most demo producers will do individual spots for you, um, for much less than a full demo. So if you want to do a specific sample for a pay to play, for instance, uh, or just to flesh something out, that's usually a possibility. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great information. Great information. I love that. So you're the guy that is known for lobster, football, family time, (laughs) and of course, voiceover. But let's go back to the simpler times. When you came out of radio, went into VO, um, and I'm going to lead into here in a little bit, the challenges of people starting up now versus 
five right. years ago versus 15 years ago. But what was one of the biggest obstacles you faced in becoming sustainable with just VO? I think the, you know, the interesting thing at that time was that a, it, it was a little easier for a, to, to do it the old fashioned way. I mean, when I started, uh, I started with just one agent, um, you know, and literally would physically go into studios, offices, whatever it may be, read for, five to 10 jobs a week, book one or two, and it was a living. Okay. Um, and that wasn't, you know, I, I played in, a, I had a 10 handicap at one point because I was, I was playing five or six rounds a week. Right. Um, it was not a bad way to live. Uh, right. I wasn't making what I make now, but I was, I was doing all right. Um, and that's changed over the years. I think that uh, the biggest obstacles back then um, were that while some <clears throat> people complain today about uh, the saturation of coaches and training and other stuff that's out there, they, they weren't around 20, 25, 30 years ago mm-hmm. when there, that stuff wasn't there. Okay. I mean, there were maybe a couple of people in New York and a couple of people in LA and, and that was it. And there was no online yeah. stuff. Right. Um, so <laughs> you sort of had to learn by osmosis. You kind of had to learn. You either came from an acting background, you came from a broadcast background, or you just self-taught. Um, and, uh, that made it harder for a lot of people because you had to kind of figure it out as you went. Um, whereas today you do have all of this training and yeah, it can be a little overwhelming and yeah, there are a lot of people out there selling garbage. Um, you know, but at the same time, there are a lot of people out there who are teaching really, really good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the ability to have that access to, to sort of cut the lead time down um, in terms of growing as a talent and also understanding the business side, I think that's, uh, you know, that that that's the part that makes it easier today. The part that makes it harder today is obviously anybody can have put together a home studio um, and there are more people trying to do it than ever. Um, yeah. Although I, I will always say that, you know, um, the, <clears throat> it, it, the idea of the market being oversaturated with talent is a little bit of a mythology in the sense that there are probably 200,000 people in North America calling themselves professional voice actors, out of whom 10,000 are, are making any kind of a living doing this. And out of those 10,000, it's about 2,000 booking most of the work. So at the end of the day, if you've got the chops, the technical ability, you know, and the drive as an entrepreneur um, in this business, you probably won't go hungry whether or not you get rich. It, you know, most people don't, of course, and whether or not you make a really good living is going to be more of a function of who you are as a business person, who you are as a mm-hmm. Right. Totally makes mm-hmm. sense. And and direct marketing right now seems to be the craze, seems to be key. Um, and I'm sure that was a change because at one time, like you said, it was you had an agent or two and that's where it came from. But now direct marketing and even the teaching for that is a big deal. Right. Uh, a lot of people teaching marketing and good uh, some good ones out there. Yep, very much Okay, so. so I have to ask this question. Um, you Boxes. have a young, you have a young oh. man at home, Tom. <laughs> I see a lot of VO folks that their young people are jumping into VO. Uh, right. I'll use Mark Ryder as an example. I watched a cool reel of him and Emerson doing a spot. Has, has Tom shown an interest yet? Yeah, he's done a few spots. Um, cool. He's done he's done some auditions. He's uh, he actually got an award for a commercial he did a couple of years ago, uh, which oh, I was awesome. proud of. Um, but uh, he, you know, we're at that stage where it's still kind of, hey, do you want to come up and help Daddy with something in in, in the right. studio, as opposed to him, <laughs> you know, having a craving and active interest. Tom Tom wants to be a YouTuber. Tom wants to be Mr. Beast. Um, right. You, you know, go. and so uh, go. we'll we'll nurture that because that'll help us retire a lot faster. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. but you know. As, as he expresses more of an interest, we're happy to keep putting him on the mic if it's something that makes him happy. And, you know, I don't want to push him towards it. Uh, it's it's got to be something he enjoys. But he has, you know, a cool thing. I, I actually, he auditioned for a Huggies commercial at one point where he sang the Huggies song, right? Um, and it's actually how I discovered he could sing. He's got perfect pitch. Um, awesome. and, it's, and it comes from Anna. It comes from his mom. Uh, I can't sing. Um, and she doesn't sing, you know, without being prompted because her family used to make her sing when she was younger. So she doesn't like to. But she sings mm-hmm. like an angel. Uh, and, uh, and Tom's got that perfect pitch and he did the Huggies jingle and I'm like, oh my God, wow, he, he, can, he can actually do this. So, uh, yeah, so he's, he's, he's having some fun with it, but it's not an everyday thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. neat. That's neat. I'm always curious if, if uh, some of the kids have interest in that. Mine were grown and gone when I got into this. Mine had to grow up around horses and I let them be exposed to the horses. <laughs> Do you want to ride the horses? You don't have to ride the horses, but they're here. Yeah, and it was I, I kind of that, that thing. Tom is starting to understand money now. And I think the more he understands money and if he starts to make a correlation between the two, he may get more interested. There <laughs> you go. There you go. That's true. Always Very true. Strange. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of newer uh, VO people are, that are making a quote unquote living with a diverse set of clients and income streams. What do we see coming in the future, forming or changing in the way talent is trying to structure where their work comes from? Because, you know, direct marketing is king, I think. But will we see reductions in platforms? Or what do you kind of see coming in the next year? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually um, disagree about direct marketing being king in that I, I like direct marketing. I'll, I'll call it queen at the moment. Um, uh, not to maybe that sounds sexist i don't know <laughs> nah. uh but the um the the reason i'm gonna say that something else is king is that i um search engine optimization uh mm-hmm. has web visibility has changed my life and what i mean by that and i've written a blog about this is that um since the pandemic ended i have found myself um essentially in a position where i've kind of reverse engineered a 1990s early 2000s voiceover career in that because my site is attracting an average of oh, just under two buyers per day walking through my website um i am now that frees me up to take these trips i take to do these workshops wow. i do to take a week off from auditioning unless it's a really big thing, right? Sure. Um, it frees me. I'm working from storefront studios more than I have at any point in the last 20 years because I'm just mm. on, I'm able to go play and I'm on the road. Um, one of the big national campaigns that I booked over the summer, the first session, I'm in Seattle and I'm like, well, I'll just call up a studio and go in. and I banged out, you know, a dozen spots and 50 tags or whatever. And it's 1145 when we're done. And I'm thinking, you know, what am I, do I want to sit in here and bang out auditions the rest of the day? What do I, what do I want to do myself? So, no, the, Mar- the Mariners are playing at one o'clock. I'm gonna go see a ball game. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, you and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, even six or seven years ago, because at that point, even though I did have a strong website, I was getting maybe two jobs a week that would come in through my site. And now what's happening is that younger buyers, buyers who are under 40, this is the generation that hates the idea of a middleman. They hate the idea of paying rent. Okay. Mm. So they are largely, excuse me, they are largely not going back to the brick and mortar world of voiceover where there's somebody taking a percentage, but they're also not going to voices.com and Fiverr and other websites that are also taking 20%, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to pay back sheesh. They don't want to pay the VIG to anybody, right? Um, So what they're doing is they're simply doing web search, Google search. They're finding us directly and they're curating a small list of talent that they work with. And that has, on an average day, I think the metrics I was looking at, I get an average of about 20 unique visitors to my website um, out of and most of them interestingly are LA and New York IP addresses um, as which means a lot of ad agencies and production companies um, out of whom an average of about 1.8 buy a voiceover every single day um, and usually these are clients that I don't really need to fight on rates with um, you know the way my website I don't have a rate card up there I don't have prices my website is designed to say I'm not cheap Okay. Right. Um, so, you know, if you walk in and you send me an email, there's already an assumed element of just the way I've structured my website, made it look that, that this guy's not going to be doing it for a hundred bucks. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the end of the day, that has changed my business a lot and allowed me a lot more freedom, uh, to not chase work, um, compared to even just five or six years ago. So to me, that is right now, the thing that a lot of talent should be focusing on is building their web visibility. And the more specific your sound, the more specific the genres that you play in, it's easier to get ranked for political or medical or e-learning than it is for commercial or promo or whatever it may be. Right. Um, so the more likely it is that you're going to see traction uh, on that. The more unique you sound, the more likely it is you're going to get traction based on certain keywords. But I'd be working with professionals Hmm. on this to try to uh, enhance your SEO. But yes, look, I love direct marketing. I think direct marketing is a a very important part of uh, anybody's mix. I really think people should be having as many revenue streams and sources of work as possible in voiceover because, you know, if one slows down, um, I always tell the story of how uh, I was, you know, a lot of people don't have been in the industry that long don't know that I was one of the very, very early adopters of the pay-to-play sites, okay? Um, and back in the day, back in 2006, 2007, um, you know, people were like, hey, Jay Michael, you're going to ruin your career and your reputation. Why are you going on these sites? And I'm like, I'm going on these sites because I'm printing money. Um, yeah. They were the, you know, but back in back in those days from about 2007 until about 2013 or 14, there were a couple of dozen of us who just went on there and ate. Um, it was beautiful, okay? It was like shooting fish in a barrel. We made millions of dollars on 
on those sites, um, mm-hmm. you know, over a period of years. And, uh, you know, it, I was an early adopter of that. But there came a point um, where probably about 2014, I started to see the writing on the wall with Voices.com. And there was a point in time, if I go back to 2012, 2013, Voices.com was probably a third of my income. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I started to go, uh oh. Um, and slowly but surely started weaning myself off of that to when I had to leave them in 2016 because I was getting ulcers because I, I, I felt like my reputation was being affected by continuing to be associated with them. Um, even though I ate a good, what was still a decent chunk of income, it was no longer a third. It was a tenth. Okay. And I was mm-hmm. able to replace that within six months. So um, diversify your revenue streams as much as possible because you never know when you're going to run into something that's that either slows down and goes away or, go, or you go, mm, I don't really really want to work in that place anymore, right? Right, right, right. Um, let me lead that into agents. Um, is there a magic formula with the number of agents, where they're located? Um, what works best for today's voice actor? More. <laughs> it's like, and, and, how, how much money is enough more um right uh so so here uh, that's a flippant answer but at the end of the day um with talent agents i think the trick is um uh, building up you know the, there are different levels of talent agencies you've got small markets you've got regionals you've got major coastal union shops right um and the trick is to build relationships with as many of them as possible um to try and get representation in as many markets as you can yes you will get some crossover of of, of jobs coming in from different different agencies. Um, you know, the idea there then is, of course, if you have a major mother agency, you give them priority. You know, the second level is that mm-hmm. if you're getting, you know, if you're getting the same audition from six different regionals, which does happen, um, you give priority to the one that books you the most, that you have the best relationship with and or whoever sends it to you first, right? Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the, the thing about talent agents is that the good ones, and there are some really small ones that are still really good ones, okay? Um, the the good ones all have proprietary jobs that you will not find anywhere else that they're mm-hmm. going and getting either in their local market or through their own connections that you're not going to find on pay to play that you're not going to find from other agents that you're not going to find in other places. Right. Um, and the more of those that you can get, uh, you know, so it's not always the big national TV spots that pay the bills. It can be the local automotive, but you've got 10 dealerships. Okay. It mm-hmm. can be, you know, the, the casino and gaming that are 150 to 500 dollars a spot but you're doing 30 a week okay um you know that kind of stuff sometimes it's the small market and regional agencies that have a lot of that so um so i do like to collect them uh and uh you know and and just have i I almost describe it as um after all these years having uh without the pay but almost a pay-to-play like experience in the sense that in my inbox on an every uh, on, on a daily basis are 20 to 40 unique agency leads um that typically start at a thousand dollars and go up from there Right. And I can cherry pick and decide which ones I'm going to do each day and which ones I'm not. And, uh, you know, have enough to sustain based on my metrics and how frequently Mm -hmm. the percentage that I book with with talent agents, consistent booking. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the more the merrier. Obviously, you are going to be typically exclusive to each market with one agent. Um, there are a few agents that want you to be regionally exclusive, but those are usually ones that are in regions where there's not a whole lot of competition. So that tends not to be such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Some of the bigger coastal union shops may want a little bit more say over who else you're with and and make sure that you get priority and that you do a coverage check with them on something before you do it with somebody else. And that's reasonable, especially Mm -hmm. if they're feeding you Mm -hmm. stuff that's in the, you know, what what, what you'll get from, you know, a DPN or something like that. Your average, your average audition from them is five figures as opposed to four figures coming from, you know, a regional or, you know, a, a thousand coming from a local or even 750 coming from a local. So, you know, you, you give you whoever your mother agency is, you give that priority to. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Alden, yeah. you've been awfully quiet. I have. <laughs> I was wondering if a mic, my mic was on there. I was yeah. agreeing a lot. Yeah. Surely you got a question or something here. I've I'm taking the, it. I'm taking it all in. I, I, I love it. Um, and that was not the answer I was expecting on the agents. You know, because we. No, all, I because, mean, it's, it's one that I don't broadcast it. I mean, honestly, if you look at my website, I don't list all my agents on there, and it's yeah. part, part of it because I don't really want them to know how many I have. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but you know, but at, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm I'm diligent about being as responsive to them all as possible and feeding them all, uh, you know, as much as I can audition wise um, to where I'm valuable to them. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the biggest thing. Once you get an agent is how do you keep the agent, right? And you keep them by sending good auditions in and giving them a chance to book you. I've got agents that I haven't booked with in two or three years, but they're still happy with me because I'm feeding them auditions, right? They just, for whatever reason, they haven't been able to land me, you know, and then I've got others I book with, you know, monthly or even once every couple of weeks. Um, So as long as you're giving them stuff that they keep listening to and go, okay, this is a viable audition, as long as you're playing. The biggest complaint I get from agents uh, about about other talent is they don't submit enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was having this conversation with one of my agents last night. She's got somebody she's thinking of dropping. Um, and the reason is that they don't submit enough. Why mm-hmm. is this person not, you know, and, 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 and look, they're not stupid. Um, she's like, I know who else this person has. Okay. So why is this person not submitting regularly to me? Yeah. I don't understand. Right. Makes so, sense. so submit regularly. You'll keep them happy. Makes Do you sense. make it a point to, to, to talk to your agents like because you just like you just said i talked to my agent the other night like so is that something that you would suggest to people like how like how often if like so i have like four agents like should i be checking right. in with them like once a quarter or maybe twice a year um, like, it's a little mean? bit it's a little bit of a different answer for me because i'm a conference owner a coach sure. a demo producer sure, and all those sure. things right so i have a job it's part of my job in those other capacities is to maintain consistent conversations with agents and casting directors and managers um so that i know what they're looking for so that i know where trends are moving so that I just have kind of a 360 degree overview of the marketplace for an individual talent. Yes, you should have some contact with your agent. I would have a little check in, you know, once every three to six months or so, just say how it's going, anything I could be doing better, any, any, anything, you know, you'd like to talk about, um, you know, once every six months is probably fine. Uh, don't be in their ear every two weeks. Um, you know, they'll get, unless you're whining and dining them and you're booking all the time, then, then they're happy to talk to you regularly. But, uh, uh, you know, the, don't, don't annoy them. Um, but yeah, a little check in you know, they, they like to know that you're engaged and you're interested. So a little okay. check in every three to six to 12 months is reasonable. Honestly, I had never thought Makes about sense. that. I mean, I've obviously had conversations with them, but it's mostly them instigating the conversation and it's typically about something yeah, real small. Right. But, um, and send them a thank the, you. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm a Christmas gift guy, uh, you yeah. know, holiday gift guy, um, little gift basket, little something, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, 50 bucks, whatever. Sure. Um, you know, but just, uh, Hey, thanks for all you do. Thanks for all the opportunities. Great, great, great idea. Great yeah. idea. I, I know we talked to, oh. go ahead, Alder. Well, uh, I, my question I had was, we talked about, you, you know, the, the big group of 200,000 people consider themselves voiceover actors. <laughs> right. And, and yet there's smaller group actually making a living and even smaller group getting most of the work. And there's people coming in all the time. The three of us have been in VO for three, four years at most. What do, what do you see? Because I'm sure you see a lot of people come in to voiceover and then just drop off. You know, they, right. they give up, they quit. What is the secret sauce that they're missing that they don't endure and stay in long enough to actually build a career? It's being a business person. Just the, um, being, being it's, the it's business that simple. Being a small business person. I yeah. have worked with talent, and people who have coached me have heard me say this line, but I've, I've worked with talent who uh, I consider to be C+. Plus. Um mediocre, not horrible, but mediocre, decent, passable, who are making $500,000 a year because they work like dogs. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. I've also worked with talent who have more talent in their pinky finger than I have in my whole body who have never gotten off the launch pad. And it's often because I talk to them 18 months later and go, how many auditions did you do this month? How many marketing touches did you do this month? And they say 10. And I know people who do 10 in an hour. So if you're doing 10 in a month, I can't help you, right? right Nobody can right. help you. Um, it, you know, the talent is a prerequisite. Uh, technical ability is a prerequisite. Yep. But then it's the, the separator is who who are you as an entrepreneur? Who are you as a hustler? I am very blessed to be in a position now in my career where I don't have to chase as much as I once did. But you know what? Yesterday, my day started at Uh, I woke up at about 5.30. My first session was at 8 o'clock. My last session was at 9 p.m. You know, and in the middle of the week, that is still not an unusual thing for me. And I'm still banging out auditions in between. My ass is still on fire. Okay. I have a a just terrifying, paralyzing fear of of being poor. Um, And so (laughs) I I just, because I I came from, people think I, you know, I've had money my whole life. I haven't. I came from a lower middle class background. When I was a kid, I got yelled at for ordering a pizza because it was 
was too expensive. Okay. Um, you know, so I, mm-hmm. I've had the paralyzing fear of not having enough money. You know, I saw my dad get fired from a corporate job and have to work the counter at Macy's over Christmas just to pay the rent. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't come from, you know, a, a, a gilded background. Um, and uh, for that reason, it's, it's just for me, I still, I, I'm still out there hitting. I'm still out there hustling it. I don't have to anymore. I could, I could, mm-hmm. I, I can't rest on my laurels. Right. But I could do less. Um, but I don't. And you know, that the talent who have that ass on fire drive are the ones who usually do the best. I'd say the one little exception to that would be, I've seen a handful of people over the years who come in and they just have the right sound at the right time. And they work with the right people and they get picked up by the right rep. And all of a sudden they're making deep six or seven figures. Yeah, and yeah. it's just right. because they hit it at the right moment. And then they're, they get into that, that's, pipeline of of being taken care of um mm-hmm. but that can go away too okay yeah, i mean sure. i've you know i uh, uh there were you know there's there's one i won't throw a name out there but there's one person i know you know they wound up actually having to sell their house because they were pretty close to a million dollar a year talent um but the the vast majority of that was coming off of one job that was four hundred thousand dollar a year contract for um you know for regular commercial work another one that was 250 for you know regular promo work and they lost them both in close succession and the next Ooh. thing you know they couldn't afford the property tax wow. okay hmm. um you know and so uh that's always good to me to me um if i was just relying on big time brick and mortar which is nice it's also scary because you don't have the level of control that you have when, when you've built your own business and you have all those different pipelines. So right. to me, it's, that's the separator. It's who are you as a business person? Awesome. Yep. Great yep. answer. That's great. Great answer. Um, with, with the people jumping in now, as opposed to people jumping in X number of years ago, and we talked about that a little earlier, the difference in becoming business educated, uh, in becoming industry educated what what should they expect on a timeline if they're going to come in there and do this right how long is it going to take to make any money and then how long maybe to turn the corner it's a different answer for everybody Mm -hmm. um i think that uh there are talent who just really have it together who have tons of natural ability who immediately fall in with the right coaches and producers and and get into the right pipeline and i see some of them booking regularly within six to twelve months um you know and, and making a living within you know 18 um, so, you know, that is, that is not, um, maybe the most common outcome, uh, but that, that is possible. Um, there are other people it takes a, a handful of years to really get that traction. Um, you know, I, I think for most people coming into the business, uh, a reasonable benchmark would be, where are you in three years? Okay. If, if mm-hmm. you've, uh, and again, that assumes that you're doing things the right way. That assumes right, that yeah. you're making the necessary investment in good coaching, that you're getting down demos that you're putting a website together that you're going out there and doing the marketing and doing the thing right so if if you, if from the moment you start going full bore to the 3 year mark if you haven't started to turn the corner at that point, then the question starts to come in as to why. And, you know, that's something that you need to start talking to maybe people you haven't worked with, not just the coaches and producers you've worked with, maybe get some different ears on you, get some different opinions. Um, one place where I get into trouble uh, uh, with other people who sell shit to talent um, is I do talk a lot about um, if you've been doing this for five or 10 years and you've been going after it and you're still spending more money than you make, you even if you're booking with some frequency, maybe find a new hobby. Um, you know, I, 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 as a conference owner and coach and demo producer, I probably shouldn't say this, but you know, uh, what, what I hate seeing out there are the people that I call perpetual students, um, who it's good to keep training. Okay. But I'm talking about people, the people you see at every conference, every workshop, every webinar, everything. And and I've seen them there for 12 years. Okay. And they might book from time to time, but they're spending more than they're making. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why are Mm -hmm. you still here? Um, right. if, now if you love it and you just want to be around it and you don't, and you don't care, great. And there are people like that who just kind of get caught up in the social side and they love the business. And they just want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. But if you, but if you're online complaining about why you're not booking, you know, and you've been doing it for that, like somebody should have told you at that point, Hey, go do something else with your time and money. 
right? right. Um, and I think there too, there's still so many people out there who want to sell the dream to everybody because it lines their own pockets that you do right. run into mm-hmm. those people who just get into that vicious circle of spending more than they're making. So look, I mean, if you're not getting some kind of results after three years of, of putting an effort to this, um, you need to start asking some hard questions. Yeah. 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 Great advice. Sure. Great advice. I know we run into that in the group a lot. We got a lot of people who it seems like week after week after week after week, they're, they're saying, I did this, I did this, what do I do next? And I did this. I had one yesterday say, can you tell me how to mount my mic in my car to record my car? And I'm like, what the hell for? Why are you going to record? Your- you don't even, you haven't booked a job yet. Why do you want to do it? And, and I never answer that way, but that's the first thought right. in my head. And you come back and you nicely say, well, if you have a 416, slide it into the headrest and right. sit in the back seat and it's like, it's like the people who go, you know, I, I, I haven't booked any work yet. Um, what should I do with my new U87 and how do I, how can, how can I train for pro tools? It's like, Oh boy. Yes. <laughs> what a, what a, <laughs> cart horse. Uh, yeah. Tough stuff. Yes. yes. Tough stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, I asked the other two guys real quick. You guys have anything else? If not, I'm, I'm going to, I know this guy's busy. And yeah. We, yeah, yeah I won't keep it very long at all. Uh, but uh, I follow you on Instagram and I see your adventures all the time. I mean, like anytime oh, yeah. you're traveling, classic pilot yeah. pick. I love it. Um, <laughs> but I also. Anna, Anna can't stay. She's like, take the fucking Snapchat away from him. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. Disarm. Um, disarm. <laughs> but another thing I love is just seeing all the, the different types of food you get to eat. I, obviously, you're known for the lobster, but you're also known for fine dining um in fact um when i was at one voice you know uh shaquana bell yeah Mm -hmm. yeah she went to your euro retreat at least the last one and i think she has plans to go the next one we were sitting uh uh, because we're we all come from uh paul schmidt's group so we were having a dinner that night and uh we asked her about how was the euro treat and she said she loved it and she was like it was the first time i got to experience fine dining and she and I, she this is her quote i had never experienced anything like that in fact the only thing i knew about fine dining was what i saw on spongebob and we, we, were, we were dying man she's, well first of all she's hilarious i'm super talented but yeah i thought that was great but what got you into like eating like these great meals i see you eat like i mean i'm always just curious man because I'm a I'm a glutton. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, like, it's like fine dining. I mean, like the, it's like the no, fine it's, dining, um, the portions are smaller. You know, so you know what you know what's funny is actually I think that uh, I, I had the good fortune of being um, a little bit of a multicultural kid in the sense that my family has a strong French background too, in addition to being American. Mm-hmm. Um, then that's my my uh, long real long story short. My fa- grandfather was lieutenant commander in the navy uh, who was stationed uh, in Villefranche sur Mer in the south of france after world war ii hmm. met a little french girl married her uh and uh, the rest is history and so we all have that french part of our heritage too <laughs> um and so there was always you know my father would cook um you know line caught fresh trout um mm. with almonds and the mousseline when we uh, that, that we would eat that sometimes when we were seven or eight years old right even when we didn't have a lot of money he'd go find that stuff and he'd and he'd he'd, he'd cook it up himself and it'd be really good so and he also worked in the hotel industry so there were weekends even though again he wasn't getting paid a whole lot uh but there were weekends we'd get to go stay at the meridian hotel in boston which back then was a really nice hotel on a comp rate for the weekend right um wow. you know and and <laughs> and get to get go have their little brunch with everything else so i, I was lucky to be exposed to some of that um from an early age and then i think that you know as my career progressed and i could afford it um we started seeking out my wife and i like watching master chef particularly the uk edition which right uh, they don't you. try and stab each other in the back quite as much they're more <laughs> collaborative uh but we uh we we got into that show and then we started going to some of those restaurants and starting to experience especially living in you know halftime in europe experiencing more of that over there mm-hmm. um and it's just become a bit of a passion uh yeah. you know and i think now we're at a point we've done so much of it that we're we we seek out more unique experiences um our favorite restaurant in the world is not some big three michelin star fancy uh over the top place it's a one it does have michelin star but it's in dusseldorf um it's a chef named volker de Koch that we've been uh dining with now for about 12 years we found him when he was the head chef at a different restaurant in dusseldorf um he <laughs> is just a master of creating fascinating flavor profiles and dishes he has a it's a gastro bar it's not white linen tablecloths right um but it's just the most interesting um assemblage of quality ingredients that we've ever found we think he's the best cook we've ever eaten with uh you know so we just like finding stuff like that now that's a little off the beaten path because we've done so much of the you know of, of, of the stuff that you see in the magazines and on tv 
That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you for that. Awesome. Cool. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And I know, you know, there, there are people who become haters. We've, we've dealt with one, <laughs> um, but there are, uh, but there are other people who look, you know, who look at this and they go, why is he always posting that? Why is he that? And you know, I've never looked at it that way. I love to see people succeed. I've loved hearing yeah. your background. And the thing that hit home is when, when you, <laughs> when you made this statement about you shouldn't have ordered that pizza, we couldn't afford right. it. Right. Well, and, look- and, yeah, I mean, I'll, look, I, and I, I, I always tell people that, you know, Anna and I have a rule that we don't post possessions, sure. okay? We don't post cars, you know, yeah, I take pictures of the deer at the new house sometimes because I love the deer, but, um, you know, but we're not taking pictures of the chandeliers or look at our fancy house or whatever else, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's It's not about objects. We post the things we love, you know, and, and fine dining's part of that, nice travel's yep. part of that. But you know what? Going to the football game. I'm going to the Caps game tonight. I'm going to post pictures from the Caps game, okay? Yeah. What am I going to eat at the Caps game? A hot dog and cheese fries, okay? <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, and it's, it's uh, uh, you know, we, we post the things that we love to do, and these are our passions. Um, and honestly, we post them not so much to share them with people, uh, but because we have this great social media bank that keeps our memories for us, and we yes. can go back and see these things yes. that we yeah. love to doing yeah. so uh you know i it's it's never about showing off it's about these are our passions these are the things we love to do these are the people that we love to be with and you know we, we you're never going to see us post a picture of a car or a diamond or a you know a, a, or even our hotel room you know it's uh it's it's more of these it's experiences and i think if you can't right. you know if you can't live your life enjoying the fruits of your labor and finding right, experiences right. that make you happy. We work to live. We don't live to work. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's what keeps us sane. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Seeing all that stuff, it definitely doesn't come <clears throat> off like showing off. I, I, I no. thoroughly enjoy it. And it's, it's fun to see. And again, like you go on a lot of cool ex- adventures, experiences, and it's just, it's just fun to, see what's out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we, we won't uh, hold you up any longer. We're pushing on 45 minutes. And uh, first off, we want to wish you, uh, Anna and Tom, a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Hope you enjoy it. This will be aired after Thanksgiving, but we just want to yep. get that in there. Thank oh, you good, for spending good. time like, with This us. is like five pounds less than I'll be on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and I both. Uh, but we do want to wish you a great holiday. Look forward to seeing you in Atlanta and in Dallas. And, uh, uh, and if you're ever in Nashville, stop, you know, give oh, a yell. Come to Nashville with some yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll dr- drinks there. Yeah. Drinks are on me for Wonderful. sure. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks everybody out there yep. for watching and uh, hope to see you around. All thank right. Thanks much. so much. Contents of another VO podcast may cause drowsiness, itchy forehead, burning armpits, or headache. Some less known side effects include mashed toes, sore egos, irritable bowel, or just an old-fashioned case of red ass. Opinions given are not fact, but opinion. And names have been changed to protect the three idiots who record this podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of It's Another VO Podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also email us your questions to anothervopodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at anothervopodcast. See you next time.